Coffee tastes better when it's raining. You know what's really <laughs> nice when it's raining? A glass of wine. <laughs> and some Fargo. Man, Fargo. Great show. Great show. Dude, the first episode is is just it's such good TV. And I don't even like watching TV and I'm I know you that. So I know. If you if you if you uh watch the first episode of season five, episode one of Fargo, and it's a self contained show and you're not like completely hooked, there's just something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. You need to go to cinema, you gotta you need to go to movie school or something. Because it's great. And I was watching True Detective season one with my buddy and I was looking for something like that, just self contained. Also, man, crime, drama, revenge story. That is like, I love sci-fi. I love fantasy. I think that might be my number one genre. Because every time I see it or people start talking about Goodfellas or all this stuff, I just get, I, I love it, man. Tarantino. This show's got the Tarantino vibes, too. You know, the mu- the quirky music, the weird transitions, like the lingering on someone's face too long and i just i love it dude it's so good it's so good tarantino is definitely that um yeah that revenge all those movies all his movies right it's like that that revenge gritty revenge story yep yep have you finished season five oh yeah yeah we finished it nice we got through that pretty quickly maybe like two weeks or so hard to stop that yeah yeah I was going to say, I was going to like talk about the episode, but I don't want to, you don't, don't want to spoil, spoil anything. anything. Yeah. yeah. So How it's just like, that. Eight I just or stopped. 10 or 12 or something. I forget. I think it's like eight. It's not a lot. Eight, maybe. That's perfect. Yeah. Yes. I think that's like true detective. I think true detective season one is like a perfect season of television. Honestly. Yeah. Agree. Strong agree. Yeah. We don't need, we, we, we don't need the, uh, the eight seasons. Yeah. No. And the filler episodes. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Although I do, I was kind of reminiscing about Game of Thrones the other day. We started watching, rewatching uh, um, House of Dragons because season two is coming out this summer. So we wanted to watch mm-hmm. season one again. And I was like, man, I kind of want to throw on some old ga- Game of Thrones, you know, just throw on like Battle of the Bastards or just like some of those awesome episodes. <laughs> and it, it, those are fun that you get sucked into. And but like, it, it's really nice. The t- television is mm-hmm. great. Like I was looking for a good movie to watch. It's nice to sit down for an hour and watch an episode of really good TV because you basically get a movie out of it. And then if you yeah, want to watch yes. another one, you can, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of Game of Thrones, the guys that did Game of Thrones just did uh, Three Body Problems. Oh, which, man. Which is, it's, I've, I'm, we're only like two, maybe three episodes into it. Um, so I don't, I don't know how. You feel I've read all the, the books. Thing. Yeah. I've read all the books. Yeah. I don't, so far, um, they're, it's awesome. Like oh, I think these man. guys do such a good job. Like obviously you can't do the whole book, right? Right? You can't do all the book, but they do such a good job just weaving in little things that like only book readers That's are going to recognize. Cool. And and yeah, so yeah, That's, high production quality, yeah, you know, all that. So yeah, I'm really really excited to uh, to finish that. That's cool. I want to read the books first for sure. Um, I still yeah, the you, first should, one, you should. Yeah, and I need to pick it back up. But um, I've, heard, I, I've been hearing I read about it. I read the comments online and it's, you know, usually a situation where like couples watching and one has read the books and the other has it. And they're like, yeah, I was lost after five minutes. So. <laughs> Checks out. Cool. So um, today we want to talk about, we got some questions we want to answer. Um, we haven't been on the mics for about two weeks. Last episode we were talking about Next.js and uh, we published a blog post since then about uh, global progress in Next.js. So we'll link to that in the show notes. That was a fun one. We worked uh, on that. We built a lot of demos and um, we have some learnings from that we want to talk about as well. But let's start with uh, some questions. You've been publishing some YouTube videos in the last month or two, and I think they come from some of those. So, Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the first question I got was, um, what is the best practice or how do you guys handle errors? Um, should I be using try catch or should I be returning an object with like a error property in it, you know, some, some information. And, uh, yeah, I thought this was a, was a great question for you because, uh, we went on a deep dive, uh, about two months ago, really trying to unpack all this. So, um, yeah, someone asked you, what is the best practice for handling errors? I want to use try catch, or I want to use an error object. Please tell me more. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. I was thinking like, uh, after that conversation, we had a like deep dive. I was like, this would be a great conference talk just to get people talking about it because it it's it's there's a lot here and it's confusing but um 
I think what started our conversation was like, how do you do air handling in JavaScript? And you go to the docs and it talks about throwing an error and trying and catch. And um, so those two things are already, those two concepts are already tied together. Whereas kind of the result of our conversation was like, they're actually two separate things. And um, so my first answer to this, someone asking this question, how to think about it and how to kind of like do it um, would be look at the docs for the framework you're using. And hopefully there's some guidance there. Uh, I'm trying to remember we were doing this in the context of a remix app. Maybe it was a remix app and, and we had, um, we had a situation that kind of sparked this whole thing where, uh, when we hit into a 404 error, we would have our route, uh, throw, and then it would be handled by some error boundary in the, uh, the root layout. Uh, but then we were kind of, we were building the course too. So we're, mm -hmm. we're thinking about how to explain all these, these concepts. So right. you hit a 404, you throw, it bubbles up, you handle it up there. Uh, and then we were doing a login error. Right. And, um, you, we were like, okay, so, so given that we know we throw a 404, should we throw a login error? And the idea was like, we were going to show throwing a login error and then you handle it up in the root. But then that's like. What does that mean to handle that up in the root? Do you like re-import the login form in the root and then like show the login form again with the error message kind of embedded in it, you know, username and password incorrect, something like that. And and we were trying to to create like this like teachable moment where it's like you want you want your login form and all that data like in the login form. You don't want to have to be like jumping into a root component to edit the login form when it has an error versus uh, editing a local login route when uh, when there's no error. And so we were trying to come up with like a story for like, how do you, how, I mean, it's basically, it is this question. It's how right. do you disentangle these two things? A local login error versus the kind of, I want this error to be handled in the root boundary. Also too, I'm saying there's like a root error boundary, but this is really just like kind of a proxy for, I wanna handle the error at the call site of the function Versus, I want the function to throw and I want to handle the error somewhere else. Right. Yep. Exactly. And uh, we're talking about in the course, this is like uh, handling errors. And so when you, when you look for handling errors uh, in something like the remix docs, or even in a lot of, even in jo again, JavaScript error handling, you, you immediately get to thrown errors and try catch blocks. And then we're like, adding error handling to our login form where we want to show a server side error that only the server knows, like this username is already taken. And it's like, well, I just want to show it right here. There's no throwing going on and there's no try catch or there, there doesn't have to be. And even in the, in a tutorial app, they show just returning like an errors object. So are we no longer doing error handling? It sure feels like we are. So that's, yeah. that's where I think this is so confusing. And I think it could be useful to have more like better shared language around it. So the way I think about this is that error handling is kind of, it's just too vague. It, it, it's not really a helpful term. It's not specific enough. It's too vague. And so uh, what I, instead, what I like to think about it as is that you have a function call and you want to have two different UI states based on the return value of that function. Um, so you could have like, is showing panel true or false? And that's just a local variable. And uh, the UI that you're writing has everything the same, except for a panel that is shown if that's true or false. We all understand why you want to use local React state to handle that situation. There are two states of that UI. UI is a function of state, and it's all represented right there. It makes it very easy and clean to think about and look at and change. But then for whatever reason, you bring in a form validation library and well, what's a form validation library's job is to validate and throw errors if there's something wrong. And how do you handle errors? You throw errors because that's what you do in JavaScript. And so now, yeah, go ahead. Can I add one thing? It, and also too, the libraries, it sometimes can get really confusing because you'll bring in one library and it will return errors. And then you'll bring in another library and it will throw errors. Exactly. And, and so, yeah. Okay. Exactly. 
So you bring in that and we're doing the same thing. We're showing a login form and there's two states to it. UI is a function of state, but now um, I call validate. And instead of the validate function returning, you know, is valid true or false and me showing an error message or not, all of a sudden I'm calling validate and it throws an error. My app crashes. Then I wrap it in a try catch. I create, define a variable out here with let, and I capture the errors outside of my catch block because I don't want it to crash my program. I just want to decorate the UI with the new state. And so, um, th this is kind of like the stage. This is just setting the stage. And I think the right way to think about, this is what I would argue. The right way to think about this is that throwing in JavaScript has nothing to do with errors at all. This was like the light bulb moment for me. And let me argue why. So if you look up throw in the JavaScript docs, or you, you see it anywhere, it is typically associated with um, errors. The fact is you can throw anything in JavaScript. You can throw an error object, which is usually what you do. And there are some built-in tools in JavaScript runtimes and environments like the browser that if something is thrown and it's not handled, and it happens to be an object that is a subclass of the error object, you'll get some nice information about it, let's say, you know, like a stack trace. But you can throw anything. Uh, you can throw a string, you can throw any object. You can throw a number. Can I throw a poop? You, throw, you can throw a poop. That's cool. what you do when you're debugging. It's a fun one. And um, that is kind of indicative of the fact that throw is not about error handling. What throw is, is a language level feature for short circuiting the current stack of function calls. So typically when you call a function and it calls a function, it calls a function, and you want to switch the logic, you want to branch the logic of your program based on the return value. Um, you know, you get the value, you call is prime number and you pass it a number if it's true or false. If it's true, you do this, otherwise you do that. And that's normally how we write software and it's you know, when you're writing a program, that's like, you're thinking through all the steps that makes a lot of sense. You go through line by line, you're looking at it. The thing that comes here comes after, and uh, you can just follow the logic down and read the program. Throwing is a language level feature that lets you escape the current stack of function calls. And so why would you use something like throw? Well, this is a language feature that's present in other languages as well. And, uh, it kind of go, Dan Abramov has an article about this. Um, called uh algebraic, algebraic effects, effects for the rest of us yeah we'll link it we'll link it. and we'll link to that that's a really good one to read but um you know it is a tool in the programmer's tool belt in the same way classes are and functions are and closures are and when would you want to use it well tip the most typical example in web apps is for something like a an error that you want to show an entirely new UI. So we had that example before where you're writing a UI and it has the, po the panel is open, true or false, but the rest of the UI is the same. You have a component there, that state flips back and forward. But um, let's say you make a request and you know your database server is down and you can't render this page. Now it's no longer about like toggling. UI is still a function of state, right? So that's still true. But throwing an error here is a method to help us organize our code and think about the behavior of our, of our program. And what we're saying when we have something like a database error is we don't want to handle that as a third state in this component. If I get a 500 from the server, render this uh, thing down here. Otherwise, render my new UI with is panel open, you know, true or false. This UI that I want to show in the event of this state of my application is so different that it's actually convenient and more clear to escape the current stack and say, well, I can handle this way up here. And in fact, way up here, before I get down to which route I'm showing and which configuration of user data, if I get a 500 along the way, I just want to show an error page. That's going to be the same for everyone. So throw is useful in this case because it is just a way to start re rendering a program, start going through the logic of a program, hitting a special condition and saying the most convenient way is the most expressive way is to say, I want to jump out here 
to the nearest try catch boundary, which is how you handle a throw. That's how you resume execution of a program after you use throw. And so that's how, um, we typically first are introduced to throwing errors in web apps, whether you're in rails, whether you're in anything, typically you throw an error because you want to render an error page. There's other times we throw things, uh, specifically in react since the invention of suspense. Suspense, if you think about the problem suspense is trying to solve and the story of composition they wanted to introduce to React application development was the idea that, well, you have a component that's loading data and so it exists before the data is loaded and after. So aren't we just in another like panel open true or false situation? UI is a function of state. The component renders a spinner if it's not ready or it renders the data if it is. So that's nice, right? But what's not nice about that is when you have N components, you have nine different components, they're all doing this themselves. So wouldn't it be nice if, if you think about it in a similar way, how can we express this, right? Because programs are written to be read and understood by humans. So how can we express more clearly the intent of what we want here, the behavior of a program? Well, we can say, if any, if I try to render a component and it's not ready to be rendered yet, I want to jump out of the stack. I don't want to continue on because I don't want to have to have all this defensive code in the part of the component that only cares about the data. For the same reason, I don't want to have to have conditionals seeing whether or not the this database is down everywhere in my app tree. So I'm going to say I want a programming model where anywhere in my component tree, if they're not ready, I don't want to have to have all this defensive logic. Instead, let's just jettison out of the current stack and we'll go to the lowest, the nearest ancestor that has a try catch, right? And when it catches it, if the thing that was thrown happens to be a promise, that's how you trigger a suspense. And so built into React is this idea of wrapping a component render in a try catch, seeing if a promise is thrown. And if it is, since it's handling that, then, um, it can render the fallback version of those suspense boundaries and wait and then re-render it again. And this is not, this is a terminology question. This is not exception handling. I wouldn't call this exception handling. And this is another phrase I think like error handling and exception handling that are too vague and basically therefore meaningless. They don't add to our understanding of this stuff. They are handling the thrown object. And so it's, it's control flow. I would control say flow. control flow. Exactly. I like to just remove all the baggage of words like exception handling and error handling from this conversation because they muddy the waters. Throw is a language feature that can be used to help guide the control flow of our app. And the way you do it is that you, you wrap it with try catch. So you catch in Dan's blog post. He has, what is his API that he uses for the algebraic effects? He uses like um, try uses and handle, something like that. It's like uh, try and then handle, right? But basically, yes, it's like instead of a function call returning and then you just assign it to a variable, just like generators are another feature. How do you use generators? You define them and then you call next on them and you can iterate through them. How do you use thrown objects? You handle them with try catch. So, um, well, I like, I like kind of starting there, right? Like, okay, let's, let's go like up to the language feature and let's say that like throwing is about control flow. Yes. It allows you to signal messages up to the stack and it's, it's like you're signaling a message and you're just sending it into outer space and you're saying, Hey, whoever wants to handle this can handle this. I don't know. Like, I'm not sending this directly to anyone. I'm just putting this out there. And then I know that someone, someone will eventually handle it because there is, like you said, there is that like root on error, window on error, whatever exactly. in your JavaScript um, runtime. But uh, we can say, okay, it's about control flow. It's about sending a message up and letting someone else handle it. But the most common case here, one of the most common cases is going to be for errors. Is um, I'm writing a component, yeah. I'm writing some code and I'm expecting the database to work. And like you said, I don't want to litter my code with, with, with um, database Defensive, defensive code checking for exactly, those cases. Exactly. Yep. So I just want to throw in that 
case. So how do you, when, when yeah, is so, like the situation where you would, what, well, I guess this is a question. When would you throw versus when would you be defensive? Should right. you always be, should you always be throwing and never be defensive? Like, right. how do you think about that? Yep. So now that we understand like throwing an error makes sense because you want to short circuit the program in this particular state and avoid dealing with it, having to consider that case the rest of the way down. Same with uh, promises and suspense. And then, so that's throw and and um, try catch. And then you say, okay, now we're to air, like, so now when do we use this? Well, we use it with suspense. Frameworks use it with global error pages. So I think error page is a good word. I think error page is like a 404 page. And that looks the same for every 404 error. And so what is the best way to create an API for app developers to render 404 pages, regardless of where they are. It's to throw because you want a short circuit and you don't care where you are in the stack. You don't care at that point what the users, current users off status is or what data is in the database. At, that, at the point you know you need to render a 404 page, wouldn't it be great if you could just stop this function execution and go render it? That's what you're doing. So that is the most common case for it. Um, and then we get to things like forms and error handling there. So again, I'm still not using the term error handling. And all of this still is just UI as a function of state. It's just about organizing our control flow. But if you want to render a form and uh, you want to show an error in it, and the question is, do I want to escape this function completely and short circuit all the work I've done to render this login form? Well, no, the answer is no. Um, and so you want that to just be two different states of the UI and you want to handle it locally. So the question is, do you want to handle the result of this locally or far away? And it has nothing to do with it being an error or an exception or anything like that for the same reason that you want the promise thrown to be handled far away so that the parent can orchestrate the loading states. You want the 404 we... to be handled far away so that the parent can render an error page. But with the login form, you want to handle this state of the UI locally so that you can decorate the login form with the error. And so there is no reason to throw an error if you try to sign up um, with an email that already exists. There's no reason to use JavaScript throw to signal that because it is another UI state. And you also quickly run into situations where form validation libraries or form libraries are dogmatic about the fact that they should throw. They feel like to be a good programmer or it is most appropriate to throw when there is an error. And so you use these libraries that always throw when they fail. And all you do is wrap them in try catch locally and use the result locally. So my opinion, this is a kind of another opinion of mine would be if you are talking about what's the right API design for a library, whether it's error handling or not, whatever the concern is, and your users are constantly wrapping your function calls in try catch to use them, that is a bad API design. That is a, that is a sign that your API design uh, could be a lot, a lot more ergonomic and clear um, and easy to use if you didn't use throw. So um, that's my thought. That's my thoughts on like the error form stuff. It I, you shouldn't errors. There's there's errors have semantics when it comes to things like HTTP responses, right? So that's kind of that's something that's part of it. But when it comes to UI as a function of state, there is no reason to throw if you are going to be handling it locally, that doesn't buy you anything. It doesn't do it. It doesn't make your code like correct. And when we talk about how do I do exception handling or error handling in JavaScript, and we're talking about both things like validations or, you know, invalid forms or just bugs that happen. Um, and we're also talking about 404 pages. It's not, it's not helpful to talk about all these things, um, right. in one blanket concept. So, yep. I would like to tease apart the, um, the idea of, again, this is just getting into terminology, but the, uh, the idea of like an error from an exception. Mm -hmm. So I think of like an error as in something like you enter the wrong username and password. That's an error. No account exists or whatever you want to show. 
But I think of an exception as something like I, I, I wasn't, something happened and I wasn't actually like, I didn't even know that was possible. So that's, a, I know that you can enter a bad username and password and I can build a UI around that. But, and you've thought uh, about it I, while you were building the, the code, you were writing the code, yeah. you've considered that case. But I wouldn't expect something like, I don't know, fetch is undefined. Um, so that, that feel like, or just like the database is down. Like if I'm writing a server component and it's talking to a database by the time I'm rendering that component, I just expect the database to be there. And so in those cases, I think of those are more like they're exceptional. Uh, I don't want to deal with them. I don't even want to think about them. And so like when that code runs, I, I do want, um, I do want the library I'm using. I do want the code I'm using to, to throw in those cases. Yes. Great point. So earlier I said, like, I don't like the word exception handling because it's, 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 uh, it, it's very broad and people might use it to describe what you're talking about as well as, um, a validation error. And this is where you start getting into these situations where you're like, wait, this is not exceptional. Like people type mistype their emails all the time. Should this be considered exception handling? Are we thinking about an exceptional state? Yeah, no, a, that's four, where a, I... a 404 is not exceptional. You can expect people to hit 404s, but you do want to use throw to communicate that. Exactly, exactly right. So again, disentangling, what is throw useful for and what is it not useful for? Throw is useful for the 404 case. It's not useful in the UI code for showing um, a bad password. And neither of those are exceptional because they happen all the time. So now the question mm. comes up, right? There are states our, our app point. can get into that are exception, are exceptional things that we haven't considered or haven't thought of. Every software has bugs. You know, we always write. There's always things we haven't considered. Um, an extent, an extension, and someone's browser could mess up your your code or whatever. Those are exceptions, and this is where error boundaries come in. So React has error boundaries, and the the thing is, okay. Given that there's a whole set of states our app can be in that we haven't considered as we've been writing and testing our code, what do we want to happen when something exceptional happens? And exactly like you said, if React tries to do something, if the browser tries to do something, they throw because they say, that's like, I don't even know what to do anymore. I can't continue. You know, undefined is not a function. That's thrown. And then you would say, okay, well, in that case, uh, we're going to have a root you know, something like Remix has like a root or Next has a root error boundary. And um, that's going to catch anything that was thrown. Could be an error. If you've written one of these things with TypeScript, you know you have to account for things that aren't errors too. Um, so again, it's not just about errors. Yeah. Um, but you are going to write an, an error boundary, which is equivalent to having a try catch at the root of your app when you try to render it. And um, you're going to say something happened, you know. But now, hopefully, the listener should be able to understand that we're using that because it makes sense to throw because we want a short circuit out of the control flow of the current function stack. And it is an error, probably, because we haven't considered it. It's an error. It's an except In this case, the exception is likely an error because it's something we haven't thought about. So we want to just say, whoops, something happened, restart your app or whatever. But neither of those things are, those are orthogonal to whether or not to throw and whether or not you're talking about error handling in the UI. Um, so that's how I would answer yeah. that. Just kind of some like real world stuff that I've p faced in the past few months where, where this really is, is hitting home is uh, in Zod, uh, you can parse an object and that will throw and they also have safe parse, which is going to be the version that returns an error and tells you why why the parsing failed. And it might be uh, confusing about which one to use, but yeah, I've definitely found like if I'm if I'm writing um, a UI that like it expects these query params, and I'm just going to throw in the situation where I don't get them. But if I'm using it for like form validation, I'm going to use safe parse and and have my form return errors. I guess like there are times where like it's very tempting to set, have like your your server action throw and it throws a Zod error and then like the client that executed that action gets the actual thrown error and is like, oh, I know how to handle this type of error that was thrown from the server action. Mm -hmm. But I, 
so it's like it's tempting to just be like, oh yeah, I'm going to use throw for everything. But I do. But then your client this, this would have to wrap that server action and try catch. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And try catch. So this is something where like. See, I'd rather yes, have the exactly. server action return like the success or the errors because exactly. that's what I'm thinking about as a programmer building the UI and then throw for the actual exceptional cases where we don't know how to handle it in the UI. Yep. Yep. But this is definitely a case where it's like where you're writing Zod, you don't know which one it should be right. until it, it's like what you said you're until you're writing in the ui and right. thinking about it right um but that was definitely something when i when i first started doing this i was like oh should it always be throw like when should i use the the version that returns an object versus right. when should i but this conversation and that we've that we've had like mm -hmm. it gives me more confidence in the Oh yeah, it's not bad to get the exactly. Back here That's the other it. thing too. You're not like language fighting if you're not yes. throwing and try catching every time you're dealing with error handling in JavaScript, right? <clears throat> Which is um, something oh, I want to get across because people people do they look for how to ha handle errors in JavaScript and they find articles on try catch throwing in a new error class and then you go to the login form case and you're like, wait, okay, I'm trying to be a good JavaScript developer. Um, you know what I mean? But they're just, they're, mm -hmm. they're separate concerns. So is, uh, is there like a nice heuristic here we can wrap up with? Like, is there, you know, just if you yeah. want to handle it locally, it's an error object. If you want to short circuit, um, you throw and there are cases when there are expected errors that fit into both buckets. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Handle it locally. Then don't try catch. Don't throw. Just do function return values like you do everywhere else handle it globally, handle it far away. That's when you want to throw. And um, both of those cases can happen for errors and for non errors. Um, so cool. if a library like Zod gives you both, then use what's which is appropriate and don't there's no right or wrong answer uh, apart from the context. So cool. Yeah. Before we move on, I, I want to give you some uh, some I want to sprinkle some crack on your plate here. <laughs> some catnip. Um, yeah, some catnip for you. Uh, there's a there's some some really cool stuff that Next throws errors for for control flow. So uh, uh, we've talked about suspense and promises. You know, obviously errors, right? When you get an error, rendering error, uh, redirects. When you're writing a, a server component that redirects, uh, you don't want to continue running the rest of the code. So Next in that situation just throws. Kind of brings up like. Um, this interesting situation. Like imagine you have a component that suspends and then so you've rendered part of the UI and then uh, you have a redirect in some suspended component. When that component renders, it's gonna throw. And Next has this whole kind of like this orchestration of error boundaries set up that specifically check for a redirect error. If they come across it, they just start doing the client side redirect. So it's, it's a perfect example of throw for control flow interesting and, very interesting it reminds yeah. me of like you know in middlewares and express you have ways to get to a point of your branch of logic where you just say i'm done like get me out of here right you call like you know you don't call next you you call like i need a fork over here or whatever i need a short circuit yeah and don't short continue circuit. the chain don't continue yep. and this is a way to do it since javascript doesn't have this in like a way that other languages do more um more built in the way i guess functional languages would have the notion of algebra they have effect. like an either like an yeah e they have yeah, like an either yeah exactly um this is a way to 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 um to to shoehorn it in to it's not even shoehorning because it is it is a language level feature it's just the design of it and the culture of javascript is not used to writing our own user land code that uses throw and try catch a lot to do the kinds of things that you could use this for in other languages. So that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty awesome. You could imagine some pretty gnarly, um, APIs like framework APIs that are based on this, that you never know about, but lets you do the kinds of things that Ruby can do with rails, which is like method miss. It's kind of like method missing, you know, it's kind of like a poor man's method missing. <laughs> you could just have Pro a giant proxy, try proxy catch. objects. Pro yeah. You can have a, a giant <laughs> try catch block. And if you can, th you can throw like all these different things and check for oh it. <laughs> that sounds like I am just idea. my, my hand in my head, right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> head in hand right now. <laughs> Anyways, that's an awesome example. Did you have another one? Cool. Yeah. 
Um, not found works similar, but it's harder mm. to communicate mm. th- it with not found because you're already in the state of, well, not found is an error, but redirect isn't an error. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, um, mm-hmm. it's, I think it's a really nice example of throwing for control flow, not yep. for erroring. That's cool. And, um, yeah, yeah, it's, you can, you can, you can go to the next JS repo and search for, I think they call it like redirect boundary or something like that you'll totally understand the code and cool. listening. So nice. Um, yeah, it's an awesome example of control flow. Throw for control flow. That's great. Didn't we have another example that we were like noodling around about a boundary that could be added to React? What was that? Well, I think we wanted the idea, and and I've wanted this, especially with working with uh, RCs. I want, when you throw, you it's an error boundary that uh-huh. catches it in in react and um you have to like decorate your errors with with um with like meta information that's like hey this is an error but uh don't it's not actually an error and i want this like error boundary that i'm injecting in the page uh to uh to catch it but i don't want normal error boundaries to catch it which means if like some user comes along and puts a normal error boundary around your code that's throwing something for control flow, Mm -hmm. their error boundary is going to catch it and they're going to have to test it and be like, oh, wait, this is an error, but it's not actually an error that like, it's not actually an error, so I'm just going to rethrow it. Rethrow it, it. yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it'd be really cool if, if, um, just not, not, this is not just React, just anything. Like I would love to, to like, how could you do a try catch or an error boundary system that listens for specific type of errors? Right. Because when you do try catch, the when you throw, the first thing that has a catch is going to catch that. It'd right. be cool if you could say, I, I want to catch, but I'm only interested in actual errors or I'm only interested. You could have in a so. boundary and then you could specify like if it's a subclass of, you know, Mirage error, if it was a library we were working on. And then otherwise it just keeps going up and that way it can kind of compose in the tree. Yeah. yeah. And you, you end up doing that. The problem right. is when someone else comes along and like inserts their own error boundary. If they're not yours, doing that, if they're not checking, yeah, they, then they're going to start catching your errors right. and they're going to be like, why, why, what is a redirect error? Right. Like that's, you know, and right. And right, right. So the, um, the you other, have, yeah, go, yeah ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The, the other, ba- the other boundary we had talked about using throw for was caching. So in Rails, there is the ne- nest, the idea of the R- Russian doll caching, which is done at the at the UI level in the tree of components of your HTML. So you can imagine trying to render something, and if there's a cache key, you start and you just check the cache. You already have it. You want to just short circuit. You want to get out of there. You don't want to do any of this other work. You don't want to because you already have it in the cache key, in the cache for that key, and so you just return that instead. So that's another interesting idea of being able to Mm. use boundaries that are composable, that are components, and um, how throw could help you avoid that. Um, Pretty interesting, right? There was also this great article. So we said earlier, like JavaScript developers usually don't use, um, you know, throw and they don't write their code like this. So which is why you don't see this a lot. And like, this is usually something that is relegated to the area of like error and exception error handling, but like we said, suspense is a pretty popular use case for something else. Um, one of the main reasons I think suspense did hop on this train of using, of using throw for control flow and also next with redirect is because of the color, what color is your function article? And it is specifically because of async issues. So if you had, if you, if you didn't have any async functions in your program, then it's a lot easier to like return, you know, just like start and you can just return early or something like that. And now that's kind of a way to delegate, to to relegate handling this control flow to the parent. I'm just going to return early. And now the parent can just do, but with async, it gets a lot harder. And so um, if you had every function was an async function or every function was a generator, right? This, this, this article called what color is your function talks about how things like async or generators contaminate everything else in the stack above it. So generators basically give the caller of a function, a way to ask for the next step. And so that gives them a lot more power from a control flow perspective, but that makes that contaminates everything in the stack. You have to write everything as a generator if you want anything to be a generator and to be called to calling it to be able to use the, the features of generators throw is a way to basically get that 
without changing mm. the fact that you are able to write normal functions and async functions in your stack. So that was a big part of the reason why suspense used throw as a control flow thing. And if you remember when suspense came out and was announced at conference talks, people, a lot of people got upset. They were like, you're using throw for control flow. That's not what it's designed for. That's like, you know, it's for errors. But I think they were right because this idea of algebraic effects and exists in other languages and throw does not have anything to do with errors specifically. It's just a language feature that can be very useful for both errors and non errors and errors can be uh, better handled locally or globally, depending on the context. So they're really just two different things. So mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll put a link to that, that article as well. Cause the, what color is your function was really was, is part of this of algebraic effect stuff. Um, and it's, it's pretty, pretty fascinating read. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. You want to do one more question? I think you had one more from uh, your YouTube. Yeah. Next question. Um, this question was someone that is building a blog and they're building it as a static site. And uh, they got to a point where they wanted to add a like button um, at the bottom of the blog post. And um, they wanted to change the styling of the like button based off if the user had liked the post or not. And they were basically saying like, you know, it's a static site. So what's the best way to find out if the user had, had liked the post? I'm thinking of doing something like a client component that invokes a server action. And then the server action will like return, you know, did like true or false. And I will be able to change uh, the styling in, in that situation. So mm -hmm. basically, Static site, but now I need to decorate it with some user information. What's the best way to go about that? Interesting. Do you have some thoughts? Yeah, uh, this is something that we we have definitely run up against. Um, I think it's really. I think just just. I just want to like before we dive into like how I would tackle this today. I think it's really hard uh, to. Uh, oftentimes, when we talk about if we have a static site or not. Uh, and just something that like you and I have learned is that we tend to, when we say we have a static site, we gen, we generally, we generally tend to be talking about like 90% of the content on the page, which is not actually the answer of, do you have a static site or not? So we have a lot of pages on build UI that are the same for every user where 90% of the pixels on the page are the same for every user. And so we would say, we would get like really excited, like, oh, we can statically generate this. This is a static site, but. The, those 10% of pixels that are different are really hard to like, to think about, to shoehorn into, into static. So we have like a header uh, and the header has to display the user's avatar, or we have um, just some information on the page. Like if you don't have access to a video, it shows a little lock icon. And so it's, a, it's just such a small region of the page, but it's enough that it changes the site from being, um, it's no longer a static site. It's no longer a, a static page. So. I think it's, it's, I think the most helpful thing for me when I've dealt with this stuff in the past is, is not trying to think of your thing as static. It's just, as soon as you have something dynamic on the page, you're dealing with it, a dynamic page. And then now the, now it becomes a lot, I think, easier to come up with solutions for how to get, um, how to deal with a site that's 90% static. That's all. Right. I, I, I also just a reflection of that, just reflecting on what you said, um, Static sites are very, very simple. And like, I think both of us would say people have like the JavaScript industry with starting with Gatsby and, and kind of the trajectory from there over the last five to eight years went heavy on that. And then when you try to bolt on the dynamic stuff on the premise that you're dealing with, you know, the assumption is that you're st starting with static, you add a lot of complexity. That would be a lot simpler if you just said, Right, what you just said, which is you're just, it's a fully dynamic site. But there are a lot of benefits to static. It's very simple. There's all other ecosystems and languages outside of JavaScript are experimenting mm -hmm. with getting as much of their stuff static as possible too. There is a lot of simplicity to it. It's nice even knowing yourself when you get one of your blog posts shared on Twitter that uh, if it's a, just a page and it's <laughs> static, it's kind of just, there's something in the back of your head that's like, Oh, that's good. Yeah, to go. hacker you, news. Yeah, hacker news can't take down your website. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
Yes. Um, but anyways, so I just wanted to say that, but um, to kind of, you can continue the story and, and, and basically uh, how we think about it, how I think what, where you're going to go is like, yeah, this is a dynamic site at this point. Right. And then I think too, like, I think kind of going with like the, the Gatsby Jamstack next pages router kind of um, approach to this would be, well, just, just generate the HTML, generate the static parts and then ship those to the client and have the client fill in the dynamic parts by having components that make fetch requests. So the, um, you have a like button, you want to change the like button. Well, just have a component, make a request to the server to find out. So it basically is a skeleton screen and then it, uh, fills in with a different button based off what kind of data you fetch. I think that's, that's, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I also, I will say like if content is below the fold i think that's like a really like i think that's a really really good solution mm -hmm. um now it doesn't have to be a fetch request so this like, but this idea that you basically start with static and then you start to to fill stuff in um i guess there's like there's one okay so um First question was, should we use a server action? That was kind of the first part of this question. Yeah, so my, to answer that, I would have to ask, like, is this going to be, if, if someone likes it and they refresh the page, will it still be liked? So are they are, is he, are yes. they logged in or are they, is he using their IP address or something like that? Let's say they're logged. I mean, I don't have that info. Okay, let's let's in. just say they're logged in. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah, server action. And then. Um, but the server action for fetching if it's liked so it would be oh because you want to keep the main content you don't want to have it um you still want to keep everything static and then you have a comp client component that runs well at that client. point you could just have it be a server component that fetches the like status and it uses a suspense boundary to render a placeholder and so it's fetching the like state on render and then when you have a server action to change it and then you revalidate that tag or whatever. And then it, the, mm -hmm. so the, the reading happening is on, happening on the server component side, but it's wrapped in a suspense boundary so that it can be statically that, no, that, so, it, that so that's a pro, that's a problem. So we'll get, we'll kind of get okay. into this, but so I think this is where I if see. you're running a server action and even if it's wrapped in a suspense boundary, you, you do not have a static site anymore. You can rely on caching and things like this, but you do not have a static, you do not have like an HTML page that you can ship. You to need to CD run anymore. a server if you have a server you component need to... that makes a runtime request. Even if you can, that makes a request time, uh, that needs to run yes. a request time. Uh, There's a bunch you... of caveats to this, which, which uh -huh. we'll get into, but, okay. but yes. So you wanna keep the site static. Let's start with the premise of like, you wanna be able to ship an HTML file. I see, you don't wanna have to run a server. Yeah, and I'm just, I don't know if this is his, like, he needs this requirement. But let's just say but yeah. this is a constraint, yeah. Right. right. There obviously is a server because you do need to, there is a server somewhere because you do need to fetch information about if the user right. had, like, the post in the past. Right. But I think just as a, a starting point, like, being able to make a fetch request on the client, mm -hmm. which is essentially what a server action is, um, to determine that, that, what that like button should look like. Okay, so you I would think use a good server. That, okay, so you would use, so you're saying this is one way you could do it. It kind of feels like framework fighting or library fighting. No, because I would, server actions are meant to be for mutations, but now you're using it to, for like a get or like to read data. You, yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. I would say with the server action bit, I there's they're meant for mutation. So mm -hmm. you you are kind of going against the the ethos of server actions if you do this, but. Um, I know a lot of people are using server actions for for stuff like this for infinite scroll. Why for... not use why not use and then like a query like um use a promise that's like fetch with the new use hook or you know whatever so React you do query that on, or you, SWR right, right, equivalent right you know SWR on the client. Why use a server action? What's what does that get you for the reading side on when the client mounts? I think the server so I think the server action is is easier I let's guess. you avoid making the just, api route you're saying right gotcha. right it's just easier so it's a function you call and it returns a value but so i think that's i know a lot of people are using server actions like this today i know it's not in like the ethos of react but 
if you're okay with maybe refactoring that when React has a better story here, right. I think you can stay on a server action. If you want to do like, if you want to stay absolute, like I want to do the absolute thing that I'm supposed to do, then I think what you said, you have a client component that loads SWR, mm -hmm. that makes a fetch request to some API route and then changes the button. Yeah. If the API route has to exist, it's either in the same app or it's in a different one. If it's in a different one, then you can just do SWR or whatever, and you're not writing that code anyways. If it's in the same one and you're saying you can use a server action so you can avoid the API route, well then why not just use an RSC and query it as it's part so, of render? Yeah. I think the reason these questions come up is because it's hard to know this decision tree. Again, if once you go down that RSC route, you are you are no longer generating a static site. You don't have a static site that you can put on a CDN or something like that? You, you don't, yeah, you don't have an HTML file. So you can't generate an HTML file. Using the suspense if, boundaries? Yeah, c correct. And then this is where, this is go this will be a bridge to kind of the next thing. Okay. This is something that there's a new feature in React called PPR. And next? It's, it, it, no, in React. PPR is a React feature? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Partial pre-rendering, so, yeah. I thought next that was the next. I thought that was the next feature. There, I guess next is the next is the one that's gonna that'll be the Spearhead. framework that that Spearhead says. Yeah, um, React has a way to postpone uh, render, so you can start rendering, then you can postpone, and then you can kick off rendering later on in the future. Mm -hmm. That is going to come together and create PPR. Let's keep PPR. We'll keep PPR in the next bucket okay. for this conversation. Got just, you. just because, yeah. Next is where you're going to use it. Next will let you do exactly what you're talking about. You can render a page. It hits a suspense boundary and it says, "Well, I can't render this. This is going to require. This is going to require something that suspends, something at request time, mm -hmm. and so it just will like leave a slot there." Mm -hmm and uh, pre-render the whole thing ssr the whole tree you will get a static render of basically half of the page not you know again a static render of everything but the like button right and then at request time uh you can fill in that like button uh, but you only your your request is only only has to deal with that like button mm -hmm. so it's kind of like um i look at this as like a nice like best of both worlds situation mm -hmm, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. like you can keep everything static. You don't have to worry about processing um, the blog post at request time, uh, and you can just fill this in. Now P PPR is like experimental, mm -hmm. and I'm I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend anyone jump to this. Like mm -hmm. I think for something like filling in a button, I would use SWR mm -hmm. in a client component to make a request, or or I would just run or it do as what an we RFC. do, which is you make it a dynamic app and just say. If this yeah. is not literally a static site, you know, then, um, well, well, I think, I think, so I kind of what you said, like just acknowledging the good parts about static, right? As soon as you do that, if your server goes down, you, you can no longer serve your site. Right. But if you generate an HTML file and uh, your server goes down, you still have that HTML file that can be served. The, the SWR request that tries to figure out what that like button right. should look like will fail. It won't work, but that's that's a better failure state than not being able to render the page at all. Yeah, but I don't want people to take what that what you just said and conclude that therefore most projects should start off static because most of the internet runs off of servers that have to be available at request time. I and mean, that's how we think about it too. Build UI yeah. is a site that uses get server side props and generates a request at runtime. Um, and that's that's how most of the internet works and that's totally fine. So. Absolutely, abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I'm more coming from like the given of someone wants to. They've heard about the want to be static. static, right? Yeah, you want to be static. You don't want dynamic. So this is how you fill in the dynamic parts of the right. page, and then um, it feels a little clunky because the client has to be the one that fills them in. Right. In the future, we'll have PPR, and PPR will run on the server. Mm. And that will have the server fill in the dynamic parts, but only the dynamic parts. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. will still let the rest of the the, um, the page be quote unquote static. You won't have to generate it. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other thing too is just kind of like, <laughs> there's so many options here, but um, running a server that renders a blog and blogs don't really change a lot. So you could basically serve that blog from cache 
it's probably really hard to overwhelm a server that's like serving a blog from cache, even if you get on Hacker News. And so, uh, yeah, starting from a dynamic world, yeah, I think is really good. I, that's what I would tell most people. But I just wanted to, in this conversation, I wanted to say, like, given that you. Static was like, as a he wants it. For whatever reason, it's not about whether right. it was a good good choice or not. But yes, yep. Yeah. It's kind of the opposite Giving of last us. week where it's like, uh, or last time, you know, this is like, let's take on this as this is the problem we have with the constraint set and then see what the answers are. But um, yeah. Also, I just, th there's just so many options. There's just so many, there's like SWR, React Query that makes fetches or right. server actions to get back like a, a value. And then there's like PPR that's coming. How do you know what to do? Mm -hmm. I think kind of the simple case would, or kind of like the, the rule set that I would follow is server action, server actions for mutation. Mm -hmm. um, React query SWR for things you want the client to determine. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, PPR is more of just like an experimental feature to watch when, um, if you're working on the type of website where it's like 90% of it is static mm -hmm. and you want to be able to deploy it all over the world. And, and yeah, all yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Just to just, it's funny because last time I was kind of going through this, we were trying to, explain like the perspective of next and then you were like kind of your opinion yeah i know up. i know because i know exactly what you're thinking right now yeah Ryan's what i'm thinking is static. i want to make sure i definitely have an opinion here that i want to make sure i share which is that uh it's it's not even uh, it's not even against the whole years that we've spent you know obsessing over static sites or whatever to me it's more about the fact that now that we have things like server components and server actions um it's never been easier to make dynamic sites in JavaScript for folks who have done React for a long time and love playing with these awesome UI libraries. It's super easy to make something now with a fully dynamic site. And you don't even need server components. If you look at Remix, one of the reasons we taught Remix on Build UI is because it feels like you're making, you are making a full stack dynamic app with JavaScript APIs. And it feels as fun with, as playing with React because you have one file where you're querying yeah. database, passing data to a loader. And you never think about these things at all. In the same way that when right. you start a new app with Rails, you never think about these things at all. Static shouldn't be entering the conversation. <clears throat> and so I, w I do wish the orientation of a lot of this conversation and, and the frameworks was more like, no, this baseline here is a fully dynamic site. We have patterns for reading data with server components or, you know, pre-server components, you know, something like a loader. Uh, we have patterns for writing with actions or server actions. And, um, you know, there's patterns for updating things after things have changed or you just refresh when you navigate, whatever. Is it a fully dynamic site? There's nothing you can't do that you wouldn't be able to do with a Laravel app, a Rails app. It's all the same thing right. because we are working at the same level now. And especially with the primitives like server components and server actions, it's really exciting to think about how to use those primitives in a stack that is full stack dynamic. And then the static stuff is an answer to a problem that you encounter, may encounter eventually, which is that my site is slow or it did go down when we share a blog post. How can I cache this? I'm querying the same blog post 300 times a day and that's costing me money or it's taking too long. How can we avoid that work? That's something that should be coming as a result of a specific problem you encounter as opposed to a, a, pre a premise that you start with and an assumption that you can't break. I don't think it's a good premise to start with or a good constraint to self-impose from the beginning. So that's Comple my, that's my agree. opinion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Complete, completely agree. I think that I think there's going to be a lot of unwinding that that JavaScript is going to have to do because since the very first Jamstack app, we have been making all these arguments for why static is better than dynamic, why static is better than Rails, because right. you can put it on a CDN, because Hacker News can never take down your website. Um, you let the client, you know, fill in everything and, and you get to integrate with services and they don't block any of the rendering and blah. And I think that react is in this spot, not, not like react the library, but just like the react ecosystem developers like us are in the spot where we want to make sure we still have those static options available to us, but we see the value of having request response cycle dynamic apps. And you and I are very much in the boat of like ignore all 
all of the static stuff. Yeah, because that's where we came. We came from dynamic full stack request response apps, and we and, that's what we want. You know, right, right. And so, maybe, so I guess, I guess to like preempt this, maybe the the way we should have started, I should have started this conversation was ditch the static rendering. It feels you do not have a static site. You are showing dynamic do data have, right. based on the requests. Just you know. Oh, but it's only the it's only the like button. Yeah. Like, how do I? Keep, it's just so, so easy for yeah, me I to know. be like yeah. for me to say, oh, okay, like sure, we can do that. But yeah. You're um, adding, you're, I don't, I don't think, especially for something new, a new project, if you add any amount of complexity to, for to develop to the code that makes you slow down for the sake of keeping it static, um, you're off on the wrong path. And especially cause the only, the only kinds of things you, you're going to want to only add more and more dynamic features as the app grows. Um, also, I don't know if this is revisionist history, but I don't know if the reason Gatsby got popular was because static arguments were there. I think one of the reasons it got popular is because I'm writing JavaScript and every time I have to dive down into like Ruby and reprogram my brain and write an API and test it and make sure it works. Um, like uh, Gatsby gives me, you know, get static props. Oh wait, now I don't have to like stand up. A, I can just write JavaScript and like get the data and the data doesn't change that much. So I'm gonna yeah. get it and it's like working with JSON. Well, now we have server components, which lets you stay in JavaScript and in React. And guess what? Like you don't have to stomach all of the downsides that come with only being able to do it at build time. You I do think throw it's, Prisma I do up. think, yeah, I do think you're right that it's revisionist history. It's like, we like working with this tool. How is this tool different than Rails? And right. let's, or, you know, Rails, PHP, request response cycle apps. Right. And let's tell ourselves a story about right. and highlight the benefits. But right. I'm, again, this is where I think the unwinding is going to happen. Right. Because people have been uh, doubling down on that well, for, for the last, you know, five, six years. They have. And so, they have. But if, if, there's, if there's enough people out there like we are, like, they're, they're like us, then um, the ex post justification um, that actually you know, Gatsby and everything static that followed was good because static is better dynamic. And that was just a story we told ourselves. And the reality is we just wanted to keep writing JavaScript because we like it. It's fun yes, and yes, it's easy. Yep. If that's actually true, then it's going to be great, you know, for, uh, for folks like us and people who think like us, because it's going to be like, ah, we don't have to stomach the constraints of static. We're just going to get our normal ORM and our relational data models with foreign keys and we're going to be able to do data modeling like we've been doing for 10 15 years except we're going to just be able to have a single full stack react app and it's going to be a blast to work on yeah dude i totally agree and this is like i'm i'm more excited about react now than i've ever been be me too because because of this and i think that server components are the bridge that we can offer and we can say, yeah, but like static is great. We can acknowledge the good parts of static and you can have the paths to the things like PPR or client side fetching to fill in data. But you can say here, here are server components and wouldn't it be so great for you to have like a request response cycle. <laughs> yeah, would it be and, so quick for you to be able and, to click a button and toggle a like button on your page? <laughs> um, <laughs> like that, but that's a bridge. That's a bridge we can offer and we don't have to we, I guess it's like, it's like a friendly bridge in the yeah. sense that like, you don't have to you give up can the things still do the static stuff that you want to do. But like we, we have shown you, uh, server components running stuff at request time. And that, that like, you can imagine that's just like a little river that's flowing through the, a little stream flowing into their apps. But over the next few years, that thing is just going to get bigger and bigger and, and it's going to become an ocean. In yeah. App. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that's what excites, that's why I'm so excited about this, but yes. Yeah, cool, nice, strong ending there, I like it. Cool, man, <laughs> well, why don't we wrap up uh, this week? If you guys have more questions, hit us up on Front and First FM on Twitter. That was fun, I love answering questions. I wanna do some more um, like live stuff soon because I, I had some live pairing a couple weeks ago and, and that was actually the inspiration for both of our, our blog posts that came out in the last month or so, or two months, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, so uh, anyways, if you have questions, hit us up. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. See ya. Bye.